back to circular motion let me ask you some concepts about circular motion about uniform circular motion what do you know about it what is uniform circular motion and what is needed for something to go around in uniform circular motion go ahead. Uh, the net force is towards the center. The net force is towards the center. And once that condition is set, the net force, it's not a new force. Centripetal force is not a new force. It is the yeah. net or the resultant of the existing forces. It's not something that is coming in as an extra force called centripetal force. It is the resultant of the forces. And I gave you multiple examples for all those things. All right, so the net force is equal to the centripetal force, which is mv squared over r, or mr omega squared, or mv omega. How you actually uh, use it, which formula do you normally pick to get the centripetal force? The centripetal force is that. Now, we saw multiple examples about centripetal force requirements to uh, complete circular path. And the force is towards the center, and therefore that acceleration which is acting towards the center is called the centripetal acceleration, right? Mm -hmm. And we saw you know, examples on a horizontal road. When I'm just walking straight, I have just the force of normal for normal reaction and the weight acting downward, doesn't have nothing more. And then, yes, you have a traction force pulling you forward, but when you make a turn, that extra friction that comes in, that is what supplies the necessary centripetal force, right? And um, so that is basically the resultant force, and you can use any one of these forms and then equate it. Now, if the force is in the form of friction, then this will come in the form of friction, and friction is what? Mu times normal force. Now, what mu are you going to use? Kinetic or static? Static. static? static. Because suppose your car is taking a turn, the wheel is rolling, but even when it's rolling, it is gripping on the road every point. It is creating new point of contacts and releasing the old contact, but it's still contact. It's not sliding. Okay, so once it starts sliding, then it becomes kinetic friction. Until then, it is fine. So, uh, static friction coefficient is higher than kinetic friction coefficient. And so, um, and static friction has a limit. And the limiting value for static friction is mu s times normal force, normal reaction. That's a limiting value. It cannot go more than that. So, yes, you, can, you need a certain centripetal force. But that centripetal force is supposed to be provided by the frictional force, but friction has a limit. You can demand more from it, but friction cannot go more than a certain limit. And after it crosses a certain limit, it just gives up and becomes kinetic. And once it turns into kinetic friction, the whole force that is supposed to keep you going in a circular path will be literally missing. And therefore, you end up skidding. Now, what is done? What is done on a road normally is that we don't want the friction to be the main thing that takes us around. So if you take a car going around a turn like that, <clears throat> this is from the back. So the car going that way and turning to the right. So the centripetal force has to be provided by friction. The friction is supposed to provide centripetal force. Now. The center of gravity of the car is somewhere there. So when the car is taking a turn like this, the center of gravity, because of its inertia, it wants to stay in the same track, same path, whereas the bottom is being pulled. And so there's a chance for the entire car to flip. Now, let's not go to the flipping action completely, but the tendency to flip is like that way, right? So what happens to the normal reaction here? Less and here, more. So it's going to basically press harder on this wheel than that wheel. And if this reduces, reduces, reduces to zero, that means it's like practically lifting off. Get it? If this becomes zero and this takes all the weight of the car, 
that means you crossed it. So it will tip over. But whatever it is, whether it's tipping over, whether it is sharing this now, definitely this wheel will get more stressed than this wheel when you're taking that turn. And friction is holding it tight in place. That means this wheel will get a lot of torture. You know, if you look at the wheel itself, the wheel will kind of bend like that. Because of this force, the, the tires will actually be stretched to one side, laterally. You know, forward traction, that is fine. It's not going to do anything at all to the tires. But sideways, you know, you, you can actually use your knee and just push it, right, the tire. So if a friction is pulling it from this side, it is definitely going to cause a lot of wear and tear in the tires. So one reason why the tires can easily go bad is this kind of turn on a horizontal surface. So yes, this friction is something that can cause damages. And once, it, once this friction cannot hold, Beyond this, then it just slides off. Okay? So, yeah, instead of tipping, which is better, sliding off or tipping, which is better? Sliding. Sliding is better? <laughs> I don't think. I mean, like, both of them are equally dangerous. Yeah. I mean, sliding off, where are you going to slide to? You know, that's very important. I mean, you're going to, you're going to slide yeah, off the cliff? <laughs> if you're going to slide off the cliff, well, I say <laughs> tipping is better. <laughs> what? What if you slide into it? <laughs> I mean, if your seat belts are on and if the car flips, uh, well, it's, sometimes it may not be as dangerous as sliding off and going off track and hitting some other oncoming traffic or sliding off the cliff. I mean, if you're taking a, if the highway is kind of turning around like this and you skid there, you know, that's kind of bad because the highway is at a higher point. And you kind of go and hit the side and then possibly tumble over and fall downward. <laughs> That's what you're looking the guards holding on the car, aren't you? Say it again? Yeah. Like you flipped onto the guardrail and it went through your car and took you in half. And then trapped your car right there? You would die. Yeah, you'd die. That's kind of something. Well, what if you skid into a river and you die? What if you just drive? Oh, then you die. What if you flipped into the sun? What if you were driving a car with like your wife? What if you just lean hard the other way and then you know all the air and they be like, Did you watch it? I watched it, yeah. I watched the semi truck do it. All right, anyway, come back to this. So, what we need is not the friction to turn us. We don't want the friction's help to turn. That is why the roads are banked appropriately so that we can actually make the turn possible. So if this is the angle of banking, and the car is sitting there, the same car, now sitting like this, and making the turn, the forces acting on the car are weight downward, and the normal force, I'm just drawing only one arrow for the normal force from here, but remember it is actually acting on the wheels, right? So normal force, normal reaction. These are the only two forces acting other than the forward traction and the backward air resistance and other things. These are the two forces acting in on, on this object, on this car. So what we do now is resolve this normal reaction into two components. One is nr cosine theta because that is angle theta, that will be angle theta. So this is nr cosine theta and this is nr sine theta. And then, just as we did in uh, for the conical pendulum, you know, the same thing. Nr sine theta is what provides the centripetal force towards the center of the path, center of the track. And that is a centripetal force, mv squared over r. And this balances the weight of the car because the car needs to be there, not sliding downwards, not sliding up, going upwards. So these two have to be equal and opposite. So Nr cosine theta, they're supposed to be balancing off. And as you can see that when you divide these two equations, we end up getting tan theta is equal to V squared over Rg. And it's not the first time you see in this equation. Now, it is not just important to memorize that equation, but understand what's going on. Because when you are solving a problem, you're not, you don't actually go straight into using this equation. They may not tell you the velocity. They may not tell you the radius. 
Sometimes they won't tell you the angle. Instead, they'll give some other stuff. And you have to basically explore through the problem and, and like solve the problem. All problems are not going to be alike, right? So you are facing a certain situation. You say, all right, now this is what I, I'm given. Can I discover all the other stuff? And then you solve it. Using your brains and not using just blind equations. Yeah, these are equations that will help you to kind of get through. But how did these equations come? Look at the steps. The upward component of the normal force balances the weight. This is a centripetal force. That's a concept. If you write down those kind of concepts, you should be able to get through problems. Now, on a ramp is definitely pre-built. From a highway, the ramp is already decided. They have that much space, so they already have the road laid out. The radius of the turn is fixed. Gravity is fixed. Radius of the turn is fixed. The angle of banking has to be fixed according to a certain speed. So the speed and the angle, they should go together because the radius goes in the construction. The angle goes in the construction. So the only thing you are in control of is the speed. The only thing that you can control is the speed. That is why you have that yellow board in front of the ramp, before the ramp, which no one pays attention to. Right? That yellow board which says like 35 or 40 or 30. Those are suggested speeds. And how they suggest that speed is because they use that angle and calculate the speed. And that is your suggested speed. Suppose you are moving through the ramp at 30 miles per hour. Let's say. It says 30 there. If it says 30 there, you are going through the ramp at 30 miles per hour. So velocity is 30 miles per hour. Now 30 miles per hour, you can't use it as it is. You need to get into meters per second. So what do you do step by step from miles per hour? First, you need to get rid of miles and change it to kilometers per hour. That's the first job. One mile is 1.6 kilometers. So first thing you do is multiply this with 1.6 and get it in kilometers per hour. So that is 48 kilometers per hour. That's your first step. Change from miles to kilometers. And then from kilometers per hour to meters per second, what do you do? Divide by 3.6. So divide this with 3.6 and what do you have? 1.5? Fifteen? Thirteen. Thirteen? Thirteen. Okay, thirteen? Yeah. Shop? Thirteen point three? Oh, you can't ignore that. Thirteen point three. Okay. So thirteen point three meters per second is the speed that's supposed to be on that yellow board. But they write thirty miles per hour because you know those speeds better than this speed, okay? So 13.3 is this, it's already determined. So speed square is 13.3 square. Radius of the turn of the ramp is, let's say, 50 meters. You know this, this radius of, the, of the, the entire track? Let's say it's 50 meters. So it's 50 times 9.81. What is the angle? Go ahead, fast. How much is the angle? Do this whole calculation. Make sure you calculate this in the degree mode. Do this whole thing and get tan inverse of that answer. You should be getting the answer 20 something. The angle of banking. How much is this supposed to? I got 19.9. 19.9 degrees, almost 20 degrees. Right? All of you got it? Yeah. Just plug this in. Make sure you put brackets properly because the calculator needs to understand what your intention is. And then you should get an answer and then tan inverse of that answer should be around 20 degrees. So the angle of the banking has to be 20. So when you're making the turn, when you take the exit, you can see the road is already like banked. 
to the appropriate angle. Now, the angle of banking will change according to the position, according to the radius. The, you know, as this is the highway, and that's the ramp. Well, the ramp is not going to start curving immediately as, as you take it. It won't. The ramp is actually going to go like this, almost straight, almost straight, but there is a bending. But the radius is now big. So you can still go at a higher speed here. So the angle of tilt here is not much. But once it goes here, and then it starts taking a steeper turn, yeah, then the radius is smaller. The radius over here is bigger. You see him? Okay. Yeah. So the radius changes, and accordingly the angle changes. So the angle of banking everywhere is not the same. It's different. And once it straightens up, it will become flat again. It doesn't be flat. No, no more banking here. So the banking takes place mostly there. And that banking is something that's very important in all, everywhere. Railway tracks are banked for the same reason. Uh, roller coasters. The roller coasters are banked, supposed to be banked properly. Okay, so there are some roller coasters that are badly designed because they don't bank it properly. And that is what hurts you sometimes. You know, you're going straight like this, and all of a sudden, like, it tilts. All of a sudden, tilting, that's not good. Because all of a sudden, if it tilts, like, your head is going to hit on the sides and all that. So you're going to be having a lot, lot of issues sitting there. You understand what I'm saying? But if the angle of banking is, like, smooth, you won't feel a thing. If the angle of banking is smooth, when the turn comes, angle of banking is smooth, not a sudden turn, then you will not feel anything. See the point. When I went there last time, they had one of them absolutely smooth to ride. Absolutely, uh, you know, nothing wrong. Everything is good. Because you don't feel anything. You don't feel like your head is kind of hitting on the supports and all that. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so improper speeds, improper ang angle of banking, that will cause a lot of lateral movement of the, the roller coaster car lateral movement, which means you're also supposed to be moving along with it. And uh, yeah, there's a wooden uh, roller coaster there in Cedar Point, far corner. It's a very old one, and the wooden one. I really didn't like the looks of it, because it was pretty old looking and all that. And uh, anyway, I went in with my kids, and so I had to go. I can't just say, no, no, I don't want to go there because I had to go there. But let me tell you this. Before that, I had a back issue. There's always a back problem, you know. And uh, I even went to a chiropractor and they kind of gave me a suggested plan of action for that. And they said, oh, you got this issue, that issue, you know, big problems on the spine and all those things. So uh, you need to change the space and do this adjustment and all those things. And I just kept away all those things and I said, let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. You won't believe. When I was going there into it and I was like afraid of oh, what's going to happen now to my back. I went into that one and that really tossed me left and right. It was really a horrible ride. It was terrible. And I was like wondering like, how the others are actually like managing to sit. I was just really wanting to get out because my body was twisting and turning. I don't know what was going on. But after the end of that episode, I came down. This back pain was gone. <laughs> the best chiropractor, go to that roller coaster ride. Yeah. I mean, it's just gone. It just went, and I said, am I not feeling it? Or is it there or something like that? Anyway, days went on, and I realized that, yeah, that sort of fixed it somehow. <laughs> so, some of those things work. Um, the angle of banking, if it is proper. Now, way back in the 80s, when I started teaching, when I started teaching, I said, you know, I uh, help students to construct a, a rail road uh, display. Uh, basically, it's a, tra it's a train with some wagons and uh, we, we build tracks. It's not like a, something that we buy from the market and then set it up. The train, yes, the train was bought, but it's supposed to be battery operated. But what I did is like, okay, we got rid of the battery and then we put in brushes. We attached brushes 
So the brushes will actually be taking electricity from the tracks. Now, what are the tracks made up of? Tracks are made up of those, you know, the angles, you know, you know the angles, aluminum angles. They look like this. Yeah, you'll see them multiple places. These angles. Uh, yeah, we use these aluminum angles and construct the construct the track. Two aluminum angles, and power was given to these two, and they were mounted on a wooden board, and the whole thing was sit <coughs> sitting on a table tennis table without nets. So the whole table tennis table, you put a sheet over it, put sand over it, and made it hills and tunnels and stuff like that. It was beautifully done. And railway gates, uh, lights, which change green, red, and all those things according to the train's position, stations. Beautiful. I mean, it was well done, uh, constructed, used relays and a lot of electronic stuff. And Anyway, it was all done fine. So once we did it all, test run. The first test run, it failed. Failed because it just went and took a turn and everything toppled over. And then I said, oh God, I never thought about the banking. I should have done the banking properly, you know. Then I guided the students, instead of just building the tracks and going on, building everything, I should have angled it right. Because this thing was going fast enough. Like, it was going fast enough, it has to turn. And while turning, if you don't bank it, it just falls over. So the first turn it took, I said, okay, now stop, we have to do some adjustments now. So therefore I had to put some packing under one of the tracks, uh, outer track, and raise it up, and then did it all. Yeah, so after we reconstructed it, then it was a beautiful ride. It was like beautifully taking the turn. So the angle of banking. Well, we didn't, uh, yes, we did a little calculation, but not really a serious calculation. We just kept packing, 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 and lifting it up appropriately so that it'll make it. We don't want it to fall inwards, nor outwards. So just make sure it's balanced. Banking is required even for planes. And you already know this part. So this is a plane that's going, that's a plane that goes in that direction. So the plane is going in. What are the forces acting on a plane? What are the forces acting on a plane? Yeah, the weight is acting downward. The lift is actually acting on the wings, but I'm going to draw it here. The lift is acting there. The lift is acting there. And uh, yes, there's a force forward. What is the force that takes the plane forward? What is pushing the plane forward? The air pushing the plane forward. Basically, what is making the plane go forward is the air force. Okay. Air force. Air force. Yeah. The force by the air on the plane. So air is not always offering the resistance part of it. Also, is required for you to propel yourself. All right. So the air. The plane is basically collecting the air and pushing it backward. The air in turn is pushing forward. Which law of Newton? Third law. Third law. And so that is what is propelling the plane forward. And of course, we have the air resistance backward. And those two are not showing here on the picture because those are in and out. Now, when the plane takes a turn, you need the centripetal force coming in. And therefore, the plane has to bank. The plane has to do the banking. Now, why is it supposed to bang? Because the lift is here this way, and the weight is this way. The same story applies. The same thing applies here. The lift has two components. The lift has two components. That's the angle of banking. So this is L cosine theta, and that is L sine theta. And exactly like how we did for the banking of the roads, the same thing comes in here. Finally, the formula is tan theta is equal to b square over rg. So the radius of the turn taken by the plane is decided by the plane according to the speeds. And the angle of tilt is also decided by the pilot. So it's a kind of balance between all these three, radius, speed, and the angle. It's balanced sort of move. So you need to tilt the plane and so we need to use all those ailerons to get it tilted, the rudders and everything, to make sure that the angle is appropriate 
and the speed is appropriate for that angle and the radius of the turn that is intended to be taken is also appropriate. And if all of them are appropriate, if you are sitting in the plane, you won't feel a thing. You won't even realize that the plane is tilting. If you have a glass of water sitting in front of you on the tray table, the glass of water will stay still like absolutely same level. Even if the plane is like this, you'll see the water level perfect. You won't see the water pouring off. Okay, so even if the plane is making that angle, it depends on the speed. If it's turning like that, let's say for example in, in an... Um, in an F-18, like sometimes the angle is like that. It's making this, and think of a glass of water, that'll stay absolutely straight, inside. That means it's proper banking. All right, so get some ideas about circular motion there. And I think I mentioned to you about <coughs> non-uniform circular motion, right, guy? A little bit, yeah. Well, the only thing that you need to know in non-uniform circular motion is that when something is moving faster and faster along uh, the circular path, uniform circular motion means constant speed all through. Non-uniform circular motion means the speed is increasing as it goes on. So if the speed is increasing, at this point it has a certain speed. And the next moment the speed is going to be higher. And obviously we need a tangential acceleration to provide that change of speed part of it. But since it is going in a circular path with some speed, there is a centripetal acceleration requirement too. Both of them are required. So in a non-uniform circular motion, tangential acceleration and centripetal acceleration are supposed to be acting together. which means the resultant acceleration is going to be not towards the center, it's going to be off-center. So the resultant acceleration is going to be not towards the center and AR is equal to square root of AT square plus AC square. Now how do you find AT, which is rate of change of velocity or rate of change of speeds, you know, those kind of things. So final minus initial over time, that will tell you AT. And AC is what? What is AC? What is this? And net force. What is AC? Equation. Just AC. Not FC. V squared over R. Yeah. So centripetal acceleration is V squared over R or R omega square, you know, only that. Either this or this. So this is the centripetal, this is the centripetal acceleration. And that is a centripetal acceleration as well. And that is a centripetal acceleration as well. Okay, all those are centripetal accelerations. So yes, yeah, centripetal acceleration is V squared over R, and that is given by your normal acceleration equation. And that is the resultant acceleration. And this resultant acceleration is not going to be towards the center, but it will be slightly off center. And that's the reason why, even when I spin this, you can see that this string is not going to be pointing to the center of the circular path. It will be slightly away from the center of the path. So when I'm spinning it, you can see my hand is kind of going around in its own circles. All right. So there's a kind of, so the, my keys are going to be always lagging behind. So when I pull from, I'm, I'm pulling always from here. So when the keys are here, I'm pulling from here. When the keys are here, I'm pulling from here. When the keys are here, I'm pulling from here. When the keys are here, I'm pulling from here. So basically, I'm going in a circular path like that. My hand is spinning around this way. Um, yep. So that is what provides this, provides non-uniform circular motion. All right, coming to, um, so, any problem in circular motion, you have to just tackle it by simply those equations and uh, find the net force and equate it to the required things. Friction may be involved. Anything that is involved, just do it. 
by just using your main concepts. Never try to um, do a problem with an older approach. You know, like you have, you've seen a similar problem, so let me try that way. You know, that will not be the right thing to do. Use your concepts. Just use your concept. The co main concept in circular motion is net force it is a centripetal force, which is towards the center. That's what is needed to, to make it go around and around. And then you may have non-uniform circular motion, but still there is a component of acceleration which is supposed to be towards the center, even there. All right. Now coming to gravitation, universal law of gravitation. Did we start? A little bit. So the universal law of gravitation. Newton's universal law of gravitation relates to the force of attraction between any two masses. Any two masses. So that's what the statement is. Write down the statement. Any two masses any two masses <clears throat> attract each other any two masses attract each other with a force that is proportional to the product of the masses that is proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Write the statement and then write this. Any two masses will attract each other, attraction only, attract each other with a force that is proportional to the product of the masses that is what this statement says. And that is inversely proportional, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And when I say distance between them, which is the distance between? Is it this one? No, center. Center to center, good. So we have distance from there to the center. The distance between their centers. And that's what the force is supposed to be. And once you write an equality, once you, if you want to make it into an equation, these are just proportionals. So there are some constants that you need to consider, and that constant is capital G M1 M2 over D squared. So this capital G is a proportionality constant. What connects all these variables together is this capital G. And this capital G is called universal gravitational constant. It's called the universal gravitational constant. It's called the universal gravitational constant. And the capital G is the same everywhere in the universe. It is 6.67 times 10 to the power of negative 11. It's the same anywhere in the universe. You talk about any two pieces of matter anywhere in the universe, be it one star with another star, be it earth and moon, or be it earth and sun, or anything. That's a constant of proportionality, which is 6.6 when 10 to the power minus 11. Now, if you want to investigate to find out what is the unit of this capital G, the best thing to do is put the units of all the other stuff that you know. What is the unit of F? Newtons. Newtons. What is the, let G be as it is. Okay. What is the unit of M1? Kilograms. And M1. M2. Kilograms. So it's kilograms squared. Over. What is D measured in? Meters. And so meters squared. Now, can you make G the subject of the equation? Yeah. yeah. So, what do you get? Kilogram squared divided by meters squared times this. So, if you want to make single out the G, G is equal to Newton times meter square divided by. So, it's Newton 
meter square kilogram minus 2. So that is a unit of capital G. That is a unit of capital G and this thing is always provided for you. You're not supposed to memorize that, those numbers. It is a universal constant, but it is something that will be provided to you. So with these numbers, we can actually figure out what is exactly the force between one object and the other object, gravitationally. Now, what do you know about the force? Which force is bigger? They are the same, Newton's third law once again. This is a gravitational pull by M2 on M1. That's a gravitational pull by M1 on M2. And they're supposed to be the pairs. So those forces are exactly equal and opposite, no matter how big they are. Now the gravitational force between two objects won't be that visible to you because it's a weak force. Gravitational force is one of the weakest forces and it's a long range force. So gravitational force will be there, but it's pretty weak. And if you want to see its action a little bit, then the masses need to be really big. Okay, if the masses are really big, then you can actually see that gravitational force is big enough. Yes? So why is the universal gravitational constant 0.67 times 10 to the negative? Oh, those are experimentally done. It is an experiment. <laughs> <laughs> can you please, please, please shut up. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> now let's look at how these things, or the universal law of gravitation, kind of applies. Um, that's the Earth, and that's me, not to scale. So my mass is 80 kilograms. The Earth's mass is 6 times 10 power 24 kilograms. You know, the precision is not very good, that's why we just write 6, it may be 5.9. It can be around there, but it's not a perfect number. Yeah, but it's 10 power 24. The order of magnitude is this. What is the gravitational force between me and the Earth? So the gravitational force between me and the Earth, if you have to work it out, you just use the equation G M1 M2. One of the masses is mine. This in square, 6.67 10 power minus 11. Take your calculators out. 80 kilograms times... The mass of the Earth is 6 times 10 power 24 divided by d squared. What is, how far am I from the Earth? Zero. What is d supposed to be? Oh, uh, this is the center, to the center to center. My center is not very significant, but the Earth center. How far is the Earth center from me right now? I have no idea. Four feet. Approximately. The Earth is now center. It's flat. Oh, is it like 50 miles? Well, if it's 50 miles, just think of it. 50 miles, 2 pi r is supposed to be circumference. So 50 miles is like 314 miles to go around the earth once completely, is it? No. <laughs> so let's just say like it's at least it is 4,000 miles. We're going to transfer that to meters. Yeah, you need to convert it to meters by multiplying by 1.6. So 6,400 kilometers. Even that is not right yet because kilometers, we don't want kilometers, we want meters. So change it to meters 6.4, 10 power, no talking. Six point four ten power six meters. That is the distance between me and the center of the Earth. Now that number is also not a fixed number because the Earth is not exactly a sphere. It's kind of flattened on both sides and it's bulged out like that. Sea level. Because Earth during its formation it was spinning, and because of the centripetal force necessary to hold this in place. Yeah, the centripetal force was needed to kind of hold it in that same circular path, but failure to hold it properly is what created the bulge. You understand? Nice. Look at those people. 
So the earth is actually kind of flatter on the top and so the distance from the center to here is definitely different from here. An approximate value is what I said is 4,000 miles, which is 6.4. So on an average, if I consider that to be a circular, you know, spherical shape, that is 6.4, 10 power 6. So we'll put that here, 6.4 times 10 power 6. Is that okay? Sure. Yeah, yeah they're squared. Squared. That squaring is something that most students forget. That's why I'm highlighting that. Many students tend to forget that thing. You do everything else and then miss the squaring part of it. So calculate this and let me know what do you get. That's 781.6. So 782 uh, kil uh, newtons. So the force, <coughs> the gravitational force acting on me is 782 newtons, which means I am being pulled down with 782 newtons. How much am I pulling the earth upward with? <coughs> 782 newtons. What do you call the 780 newtons? Normal the force with which Earth is pulling you. What is another term for it? Mg. Weight. weight. Yeah. So this is the weight. Mg. So you can check it out. My weight, my mass is 80. So what is 80 times 9.81? 784. 784, 782. See, it? numbers are close. Can you see that? Now, why the numbers are not perfectly matching is because of the uncertainties in these numbers. 6, 10 power 24, there are uncertainties, uncertainties there. 6.4, 10 power 6, there are uncertainties there. So because of all that, you can see the numbers are getting close, but it's not exact. So the weight is basically this. So what we do normally to find the gravitational force is mass times gravity. That's basically this. But now we got it by using universal law of gravitation. Is that clear? Yeah. Now what if, what if someone put me on a thousand mile high tower? <laughs> Just imagine, okay? All these are imaginations. Imagine there was a thousand mile tall tower and someone perched me there, 80 kilograms sitting on top of that tower. Now, the force, how do you do the calculation? You're going to, ch you're going to, ch everything is fine except this, right? So what's the total distance now? It's going to be 5,000 5, miles, which is how many kilometers? Uh, 8,000 kilometers, which will be converted to meters, and then it will be 8 times 10 power 6. So it would be 500 point So 500, so almost 500 newtons. So I will weigh 500 newtons when I'm there. Make sure. So when you're on a plane, do you weigh less than you do on the ground? But the plane is just uh, how many miles away? Oh, I don't know. Six, seven? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Five? Yeah. <coughs> Five, six, seven is nothing. You can actually see like 4,000 plus five, six miles is not going to make a major difference. Yes, it will be. It is slightly less, but so small. You're yeah. in space a thousand miles. So oh, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. you have zero with it? Yeah. No, never zero. G yeah. is never, never zero. So how far out would you have to get for that to be, like, insignificant? As far as you go. So, <laughs> oh, we'll see. <clears throat> Pay attention now. Pay attention. See, it's 500 newtons, which means what? If I take a scale that was calibrated on the ground here, when I stand on the scale, it used to read 80 kilograms because our scales are calibrated in 80 kilograms, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in kilograms. So, I take the same scale and put it on that tower. What will the reading be? What will it read? Read 51 kilograms. That's right. So what you do is just equate it to mg, but the m is the one which you are, because the thing is calibrated in masses, right? Mm -hmm. And it was calibrated when the g was 9.8. Mm -hmm. The scale doesn't realize that you are far away. So use 9.8 over here, and you can actually figure out that the mass seems to be just only 51 kilograms. It's not the mass that's changing, all right? Remember that. Mass is staying the same everywhere. It is just the force changes, and therefore, apparently, the mass seems to be lesser. Yeah. 
You'd be in the space station. Wouldn't you just be floating and not able to use the scale? There's no... What do you mean? Because you're a thousand miles up. <laughs> we'll get there. Gravity is still affecting you. So gravity... You'd be weightless. No, 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 no. no. Wait a minute. I know you're thinking ahead, but we'll get there. Just a moment. Hold on. Hold on. Yes. This might be thinking ahead just too, but like, we do an equation to see like how far up you'd have to be for uh, just the space force to be like one new. Yes. We will. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Pay attention. And then you'll get there, and then you'll say, oh, that was the answer. Okay. So turn around right now. We'll get there soon. Yes. So why do they call it zero gravity? There's no place there's zero gravity. I'll get there again. Just hold on. Hold tight. So, what if, now you're going to do this calculation without the help of a calculator. Just look at the board and tell me the answer. You're not doing any calculations with a calculator now. Suppose someone put me on a tower that is 4,000 miles high. What will be my weight? I mean, the sense, what's the force right there? Now, no more calculations with them. Don't do anything right there. Just look at the board and tell me. All right, when I was on the ground, I was weighing how much? Seven, I mean, seven, uh, 80, 782. How much will I weigh over there? Just tell me that answer. 40, no. It would be the square root of 782, wouldn't it? See what's going to be the majorly changing there. That's it. Your distance. So all these are staying the same. It's the distance. What happened to the distance? Distance got doubled. So when distance get doubled, what will happen to the bottom here? Quadruple. So the force will be one fourth. Four times less. So one fourth of seven eighty two. How much is that? <laughs> yeah, 782 divided by 4, that's what you're supposed to be weighing there. Now, the, the, the same way as we are discussing the weight, we can also see uh, how gravity is going to change. The gravity on the Earth's surface is 9.81. When you go here, it's definitely going to be smaller. How many times smaller? Four. 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 Because this equation that you see here, g m1 m2 over uh, d squared, isn't this the same as m1 g? M1 is my mass. Yeah. So if I knock off this, what is a g? That is gravitational. That is a g. Whatever you see here, my, uh, taken off my mass, that's a g value. <laughs> Which over here is 9.81. But when I go there, it's going to be? One fourth. So if I plot a graph of gravity, I mean acceleration due to gravity, from the surface onwards. On the surface, acceleration due to gravity is g, 9.81. And now if I go one radius away, that is one radius away. So when I go one radius away, the total distance becomes two times, right? Yeah. So the gravity will drop to how much? Acceleration into gravity? One half or one fourth? One fourth. One fourth. So you can see the numbers drop from g to g over four. What if I go one more radius away? In other words, I'm going here. Be one. One fourth. Previously, the distance was d. Now it is how many d's? One, three, seven. So, come on, one ninth. Yeah, it's one ninth. Yeah, it's one ninth of g. So at this point, it's going to be one ninth of g, which is going to be somewhere here. What about if I go three times the radius of here as a height, like I go here? It's one sixteenth. And then 1 25th. And like that. So the graph you can see is kind of going like this. Literally. So by the time you go some distance, it's almost gone. It'll be in decimals. But you can't say it's gone completely. 